All right, I'm Tim Dennis. I'm from UCLA. I run the, the Library Data Science Center there. Um, and welcome, everybody. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kat Kozier. I'm the data librarian uh, at UC Riverside. Hi, I'm Stephanie Labou. I'm the data science librarian at UC San Diego. And hi, everyone. My name is Lee Fan, and I'm data science facilitator at UCLA uh, Library Data Science Center. All right, welcome everybody again, and hopefully you're here to learn about um, APIs. And API stands for Application Programming Interface. And it's really, a, you can think of it as a tool that makes a website, website's digital content or data digestible for a computer. Uh, through it, a computer can view and edit data just like a person can by loading pages and submitting web forms. So it's a way to compute on a website without going through a browser. Let's go back. What's this like? I like this metaphor. It's like a restaurant. You know, say you want to make a pizza. You don't want to go to the store. You don't want to get cheese, dough, wait for everything. You go to your app. You select some things off a menu. You submit. You either have it delivered or you go pick it up. So an API is an interface that obscures this complexity of the stuff happening in in the kitchen and it lets us make requests to get response. Typically it's for like data, you know, but it can be other things that we request, right? Um, some everyday examples you might be familiar with, your web weather app on your phone is actually an application that's hitting all these APIs that will give us like live weather data. NOAA, which is the main kind of like a National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, they do the monitoring a lot of weather through sensors and satellites and all kinds of stuff. That's actually informing the, um, the rain model that is, is uh, the forecast in your, in your iPhone app. Weather Channel is giving you the 10-day the kind of um, forecast. And then there's another company that provides like the air quality data. So those are all pulling in from different sites continually to give you live data. Another example, this is my favorite coffee in LA that I order online and get delivered to PayPal. Somebody on the, um, in the, the Canyon Coffee, the developer developed like a, a, a way to connect to these pay services and this through an API. So it gives you this seamless purchase experience. Click on the button, you don't really even leave the site much. All that's happening through, a, through an API. So why are APIs good for researchers? Data. For the most part, really, I mean, we continually get people at the data science center coming and asking about Twitter data. They need tweets, right? And they want to buy a hashtag or a topic. Um, and you can go through a Twitter API, and there's different ways of doing it to get that data. Government agencies are providing uh, statistical data through APIs increasingly. Um, World Bank and the US Census are two that I'm familiar with. Um, LA. If you're in LA, they have their open data portal from the LA city is also quite nice and you can access that through an API. Um, you share data or push data up if you think about it. So uh, there's AntWeb API, I don't know if you're the AntWeb, you can contribute your kind of knowledge to this large online database through an API. Um, Figshare and Zenodo are data, data publishing platforms where you can connect through them through an API and push up data. The last one is I use a lot, basically, this you enhance or augment data you already have. So you have a bunch of addresses in a column. You want to query an API that gives you latitude and longitude so you can put it on the map. There's a geolocation um, uh, API that is, there's multiple companies that provide that. You could also say you have a bunch of names. You want to look up facts about people that are well-known you can query the Wikipedia API, Wikidata API, to get that information and pull it down and add to your database, I mean, to your, your research. This is kind of what the process looks like. So basically, you have a client, and that client can be some tool you download. It could be a Google spreadsheet with a macro. It could be Python script, an R script. It could be Java. It could be all kinds of different languages that you develop or you use, somebody else has developed for you. You do a you request to the API, the API hits the database, which might be arbitrarily complex and large, pulls back data for you, 
and delivers it in some kind of structured object. And JSON is a, is a one of the data formats that is very common when you're querying database that you get back. And that's, it stands for JavaScript um, object notation. Now you will look at that in just a second. So that's kind of workflow. Um, there's always jargon in these things. So you just kind of have to, you'll, you'll encounter some of this stuff. Um, RESTful API is what we will, are mostly talking about today. And it's kind of the dominant form of APIs right now. And it uses the, the web protocol that, that your browser uses essentially called HTTP. And that is, it uses that to fetch um, API content over the web back to like your computer where you parse it, right? And that is important because it makes it requestable via a URL. So you don't have to know anything fancy. You just need to know what is API to the, I mean, URL to the API that I can use in my code or in a tool that I use. The JSON is something, it's a common data format. There are still APIs, a lot of APIs that deliver XML by default, if you're familiar with that. Also a structured kind of um, a data object and CSV as well. So depending on what you want to get back, careful to look, some APIs deliver different things or you can request different things via the API. API keys also are an important concept. There's, there are a number of open APIs that are just publicly open. You don't have to have a key or authenticate in any manner, but a lot of APIs do require you go to extra step to register, get a key or some kind of authentication method before you access the, the API. All right, so Star Wars APIs. So we're gonna look at uh, an example here, um, which is a toy API. It's really designed for teaching APIs and really it's structured data about the first six Star Wars movies. And it has information about films, people, planets, starships, vehicles. And they're basically the URL kind of tells you what each bucket would contain. There's gonna be a bucket of people and each person has an identifier, Luke Skywalker is number one. And each of those entities also has information that connects to other entities through URLs inside the API. This is an example of what you get back as a response object from JSON. And that is, um, you can see we got Luke Skywalker. There's the films. I cut out all the films that Luke Skywalker shows up in the Star Wars first six films. I think he's in, I don't know, is he in every six one? And then, or the species for brevity. So make it a little shorter. And with that, I wanna show you, let's look at the Star Wars API and you can get a sense of what this is like. And then I'll pass the baton to, to Kat. All right, so this is the URL to the API. And this, this is kind of common where you can look and expect the API before you actually use it. This is a good way to see that you navigate the API, like to see what it will deliver, right? Here, here's our people, planet, film, species, and vehicles and starships. If I click on planets, that will get me to a listing of all the planets and the in the Star Wars universe. I go back one and you can welcome to follow along with me. I wanna look at the films um, view. These have six films. You can see there's, this is metadata about the search results you get back, there's six. And then each one has a title, the episode number, the opening crawl, you know, at the beginning of the film, the director, producer, release dates. And then you can't see because of the white text is a little obscured, the characters that appear. Tim, it looks like you got muted. I'm sorry, how did that happen? Um, that was me, I apologize. <laughs> it's all right. So yeah, so this, this page is the response that you would get from querying films. And typically you do this in code, but most APIs give you this documentation that you can navigate through. So I think one of the questions was, which 
which plants are featured in the in Empire Strike Back, so Strikes Back. So if I go down to Empire Strikes Back, and you can search it, so there's a search parameter, but I'm gonna just for the sake of time, I wanna show you. Um, so which planets, so we have four planets. So each of these one ha have a, has, a, has an identifier. So if I can look at the first one, open up in a tab. It's Hoth, gives me some information about the planet, um, tells you which films it appears on and so forth. So there are four, four planets that show up in the Empire Strikes Back. And open the second one, and then I think I might be running out of time. Dagobah tells you more information about the planet, when it was created, um, the di diameter, all this kind of information about the planet. So you get an idea of what an API kind of returns for you. And your job was like, how do I handle this information? This is this key value structured information. I would have to parse it and the tool I'm using to make it into data, right? And this would happen programmatically. Another important thing is to note, and then I'll pass to Kat, um, is each API will typically has pretty good documentation if you're lucky. Um, it's better and better like the, these, when you develop APIs, a lot of now they'll have like spaces for this, this documentation to hang off the API as part of kind of the development process but it will always have information about how to get started, um, the base URL that you're gonna use. There's rate limiting. So if they're gonna, it's gonna monitor how much you, how quickly you can hit the site, how you authenticate, and then the resources you can get back from the API. So the documentation is a really important part of API. And with that, I will pass it to, the answers were I listed, if you can look, and. In the um, in the slides, um, and I now will like come off share. Am I going to stop sharing, Cat? Yes, please. Okay, stop sharing and turn it over to Cat. Great. Okay. Gentle. There we go. Look good? Looks good. Right. Cool. So I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to show an example using the API for the Open Science Framework, or OSF. And similarly to the Star Wars API, it can be accessed through a regular web browser. Uh, but to understand how this API works, you actually need to know a little more about URLs. So I am going to describe the components of a URL. URLs are written with specific syntax rules that allows an object to be retrieved based on those rules. Now, most of us are familiar with the basic components of a URL. That would be the protocol, servers, and paths. It's how we normally access websites. But APIs will leverage the query property to retrieve information. Simply put, the server will uh, take all of the data after the question mark and before the hash symbol in the URL and do something with it. What it does with it is based on the rules that the server follows. But there is a general syntax for queries and they are that parameters are assigned values with an equal sign and each parameter value is separated by an ampersand. So for this URL, the parameter filter full name is assigned Smith and the parameter format is assigned uh, JSON. And if you start looking at URLs when you're browsing the internet, you'll see this general syntax is actually used beyond APIs. Just know that when you see this syntax with the uh, question mark and then something equals something else, that there's something happening with that data in the URL and it's being processed somehow. Uh, now, where you find parameters and the syntax specific to an API is in the developer documentation, similar to what uh, Tim just showed you with the Star Wars API. So I'm gonna show you the OSF uh, developer documentation.
And here's the documentation here. And you have your uh, table of contents on the left. And it covers everything about using uh, the API. Um, we are lucky, as Tim had said before, that you know we're able to have this. Not all APIs have this kind of level, this level of, of um, support. Um, this uh, API is open and returns publicly available information to anyone without any type of login. But if you wanted to access data that is privately available to your account, you would need to authenticate. Now I'm going to focus on general usage and filtering, which should get you started with general API calls. They provide you with the basic API call right here. And this syntax will proceed all of your API calls. I'm gonna open that up in another browser or a tab and uh, we're gonna look at it uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, general usage. This will cover the syntax and uh, such as uh, all canonical URLs have trailing slashes or endpoints are always pluralized where user is not user, node's not node. Uh, notice how the, the syntax, their nomenclature, how they're referring to things are slightly different. Like uh, OSF calls it endpoints, whereas the um, uh, Star Wars, they actually refer to it as buckets. Um, and then under filtering, if we click there, gives the syntax of how you filter. So, which is actually filter and then the field name between two, um, between uh, square brackets and then equals your matching information. But questions you might have are uh, what is a canonical, canonical URL and what endpoints and field names are available? Uh, at the bottom of this uh, documentation, you can see there's API reference here. And this actually uh, provides endpoint documentation. So if I click on institutions, which is an endpoint, then um, we're going to see that uh, it will provide uh, documentation such as an actual uh, call, right? Uh, it will uh, give you other information, the response sample here on the right, which is absolutely um, really useful having this whenever you're trying to figure out how to programmatically um, use all of the information in here and navigate things. Uh, and then also it tells you what things can be filtered, filtered by their uh, ID name and uh, URL here. So. Um, if you're like me, you'd rather be hands-on than just read all of this. So I'm going to go to the root response of the API call. And it's very similar to what you saw before with Star Wars, but slightly different, right? Because you have your uh, response up here. That's pretty standard. But then now we have the metadata along with this. Uh, and this is at the root. It's the base level. Um, so you have all of your metadata here, and then you have links, and these links are actually the endpoints. And this is where I can tell you what canonical uh, URL actually means. And canonical URL, it's the authoritative or most representative URL format. Um, and so you can see that they have the end slashes for all of these URLs. You can also see that you, we can cl click on these. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and just click on institutions. And now it's gonna open up uh, the institution list for all of the institutions that are associated and in OSF. Uh, and you can see certain things in here about it. Now, if I didn't already know that I can filter on name and ID, I might try to see what I can filter on. And knowing, seeing something like this and just trying out different filter syntaxes are 
helpful if you don't have good documentation uh, with the API. And I've, I've seen some that don't have good documentation, but this one does. So let's go ahead and filter on um, the name. So we're gonna do a filter square brackets name equals Riverside. And now we have UCR here, right? And just returned one thing. And uh, then you can see that you have your ID here. So you can change ID to UCR. It's actually the same response. Um, and then if we changed ID from lowercase to uppercase, now you're gonna actually see what the error looks like. And you'll see that there is an error information here. Um, but let's go back a couple of um, to, oh no, I wanted, yeah, UCR here. And then if we wanted users, right? User, see the institution is an endpoint. Users is another endpoint. And so, and you can see that after the filter, whenever you do a search query, that there's no slash at the end because having that filter here, that is, a not, that is not a canonical way of referring to um, the API. But if we look at users here, click. Now you can see that there's multiple um, pages here, right? And if we go down to the bottom is where they actually have the metadata for how many total responses there are, how many per page, and then the links for going from um, what the self is, the first in the list, last in the list, previous and next. Now, if you look here where it says get, and you use that drop down menu, you're actually gonna see how you can get the information in what format the uh, request can be in. Generally speaking, you're gonna to wanna to use a JSON format because the whatever computer program you're using will be able to, I mean, this looks like a lot of gobbledygook to, to us, to me, um, but if uh, the computer can parse this really easy, which is why they use that JSON format. Um, and let me go back to the slides. Okay, so if you are using um, the command line, uh, you can use a curl command to access the data, right? And basically, um, the, what the curl will do is it'll fetch the text data that's returned by the URL. And if you use this, you should um, limit the, use limit rate to make sure that you're working within the terms of the API. As Tim had mentioned before, it actually, usually most of them will restrict the number of calls per minute that you can make. Um, but there are easier ways to access APIs programmatically, which Stephanie will cover next. And uh, answering this question really quick. So a filter works like contains function as opposed to filtering for an exact match. Yes, yes. Gen well, generally speaking, yes. It's sort of how they have it uh, set up on, on the server end um, because I think some of them might, you might be able to tell it to, that this is an exact match, but generally speaking, it's going to be uh, contained. Okay, and on to Stephanie. Thanks, Kat. So um, Kat's gonna be my slide advancer and we're gonna talk about other ways to access APIs. So Tim and Kat both talked about working with the actual APIs and then mentioning that you can use this from the command line. And so on the next slide, this is the good news part of this. So if you're interested in APIs, but you're not necessarily feeling great about using the API URL format, 
if you are working with a programming language like R or Python, there is a really, really good chance that someone has written a package that interfaces with the API you want to use. So there is an R package for um, the Open Science Framework. There's all these different packages to access, you know, NOAA and weather data, like Tim mentioned. And so you may or may not need some sort of authentication token. But the point is you can do all your work within a familiar syntax um, and bring in the data that way. And you can search for, you know, the Python packages are on PyPy and the R ones are on CRAN. But the good news is if you're going to be pulling a lot of data, so not necessarily a single Star Wars movie or, um, you know, the OSF work of a single researcher, but you're really looking to pull thousands and thousands of data sets, whatever those may be. And then you're going to need to work with that, right? Because it's in a JSON format or an XML format, and you want it to be in a more uh, human readable format. That's when using some of these existing packages can be really helpful. So next slide is going to go over the basics of the example I would like to demo. So um, I don't know if anyone here is from the health or medical side, but um, the National Center for Biotechnology Information has an API. And this is this big umbrella, but this is where PubMed lives. And so the API for NCBI is called NTRES Utilities, the EUtils. And it's got um, a lot of documentation online, and you can go through and use the EUtils in the format of the URL that Kat was talking about. So you can filter by author name or publication date or journal or so on and so forth. Um, however, there are a bunch of different packages in R that will do this for you. And I mention each of them because they pull the data in slightly different ways. So the R NTRES pulls the data in the, the basic JSON format that is coming out of the API. Easy PubMed tends to pull results in an XML format. And the one that I tend to use is this RISMED one, which can access bibliographic information from the NCBI databases because it pulls it back in more of a nested data frame or a list of list formats. And so when you're thinking about what package you want to use to pull data from an API, it can be useful to read through in terms of what data format is it giving you and are you comfortable working with that format. So next slide. The one we're going to talk about today is using this RISMED package to get article metadata for a bunch that's going on in PubMed. So yes, Kat, if you could please press play. Okay, so this is, I'm in my RStudio console, and this is script is going to use this RISMED package to pull metadata from PubMed based on a subset of attributes and then convert it into a table format. So I, of course, need to load my packages. The RISMED package interfaces with the PubMed API and Tidyverse is for some data wrangling. So pulling data from PubMed is really straightforward. First, I define my search topic. And this is exactly what I would search if I was in the PubMed basic interface. So after I have my search term, this eutil summary function is what is interfacing with the API. So I can specify what database I wanna pull from and then look at what it returns. So I can see that this is actually what it is searching in the API. So it's searching all the fields and it says that I have over 2000 results. So this is just a first pass. Once I've done this, I can actually use this eutils get which is the get function that's interfacing with the API to get the records that are associated with this. So the only two lines of code that are actually interfacing with the API is the eutils summary function and the eutils get function. So this is where I define my search term, define the database I want to pull from, and then pull this actual data. So what I have done is I can stay within my R Studio uh, format. I can stay within my language of choice. I don't have to go through all the API documentation for PubMed or NCBI. I read through the documentation for the R package, which I'm a little more comfortable with. 
And so it walks out which functions I should use. I don't have to authenticate. It goes out, it queries the API for me, and then it's gonna bring back the results. So this does come with some caveats. When you're using the base API for PubMed, you can pull, I think it's 100,000 records at a time. The way that this R package gets around the rate limits and not needing an authentication key is it's only going to return you a thousand results at a time. Now there is a way to get around this. So by default, I am getting uh, the first thousand, but I could say I want a thousand and one to two thousand, two thousand and one, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is the real time of how long it took to pull the records. So I'm expecting a thousand results, remember. It's pulling the first thousand out of my first 2200. Um, and I can see that it's this large object that I have in my environment now. So again, I can change this, but by default, it is important to know that it's only going to pull the first thousand. If you try to set that to be 5,000, it is going to cause an error, which I have learned the hard way. Okay, so now we can look at what has been pulled. So it is pulling all this metadata. I've got my PubMed ID. I've got all sorts of publication date information down to the minute. And then I've got all my author information and so on and so forth. Okay, I do wanna mention though, that if you're paying attention, you can see that what is returned has only 997 objects. So I dug into this when I was doing this demo. And when I did this, it turned out that the three that were missing were very recently published articles. So there was a bit of a lag in the API. Now I had this problem with all the R packages I tried. So it was something on the API end, but it's definitely worth noting, always double checking that you're getting the amount of results that you are expecting. Because sometimes there can be a bit of a lag anytime you're using a programming language. Okay, so I've got all this data, but it is in this list of list formats. And what I really want is something like this. So I can just have single columns of things like my PubMed ID. So this is me going through and extracting the data. So again, my PubMed ID, my article title, I can pull these out and have them as objects. Now this is where it gets a little tricky. So authors are returned as actually a data frame within this list of lists. So this is fine. This gives us all the information about first name, last name, initials, order of authors, but it's not really what I want. If what I want is a single column that has authors that I can then put in a spreadsheet. So I can use R. Again, this is not using any of the you know, API interface. This is strictly using R to reformat the authors list to give me something that looks like this, where I'm going to have my first initial, last name, author separated by a semicolon. So there is a little bit of work that may need to be done based on how the data is returned. So I can go ahead and extract all the other information like publication date and journal title and DOI and so on and so forth. Once I have all of these, I can pull them together into a tabular format, which is going to give me a basically a spreadsheet that looks like this. So I've got my PMID, my article titles, I've got my authors formatted into a single column. All my publication information, if it is there, if there's a missing value, it means it was not available through the API. And then of course the abstract can sometimes pull a little bit of, um, you know, website information like that label that you can deal with downstream. So then I can go ahead and actually write this out to a CSV. Um, I use this example because I got a request from some med school faculty who said, you know, I want the 60,000 papers that meet some criteria, but what I want is all the metadata in a spreadsheet. So based on that criteria, the fastest and easiest way to do it was not actually to use the API through um, NCBI, it was to use it within R, pull all that data and then format it so that it's in this nice readable spreadsheet that someone can use. So again, the caveats are of course, making sure that you are getting what you're expecting in terms of number of results. It does of course mean you do have to be a little bit familiar with either R or Python, whichever one you're working in. But I like to mention it because PubMed itself, again, has three 
are packages that you can use. Government websites usually have APIs and the R and Python community was worked really, really fast. So there are usually packages to interface with those APIs. So if you're pulling large amounts of data that then you're then immediately going to analyze in some platform, you can do that from exactly within your platform. So you don't have to go out, grab a bunch of text data or JSON data and then import it. You can do everything from within either R or Python. And that um, ends my section. So now we're gonna go and have Lee talk about additional resources. I'm muted, of course, that needed to happen. Um, all right, so thanks, Stephanie. So now, now you've seen through the previous examples that there are many APIs through proprietary and open sources. So, um, well, we haven't talked about proprietary yet, so we're gonna go into that now. But um, so some sources are scholarly, like the PubMed API and the OSF APIs, and um, others are more experimental, like the Star Wars API. Um, so next slide. Yeah, so this is what I mentioned. Um, did you advance to the next one? So, oops. Mm, yeah, this is fine. Okay, so uh, this is a shameless plug for the UCLA library because we recently launched a guide to scholarly APIs. Um, if you could click on that link, Kat, or Stephanie. <laughs> um, so here you can see that we have a list of different APIs that we have available through our institution. We have over 40, 45 APIs that are either open or require subscriptions through our, through our institution. Um, some of them are provided through publishers and academic sources, while others are open. Um, one of the ones listed in there is the New York Times API, which is, um, does not require a subscription. So make sure you check with your campus for information on access and usage. Um, they, somebody at the library should be able to help you with that. And I should say that our, our guide was adapted from the UC Berkeley, UC, and UC San Diego, and MIT Libraries guide. So there are sources out there. Um, next slide, slide please. So one example um, of a like not scholarly API is the New York Times API, which allows you to search their articles by date, um, word count, and subject. So this is one um, uh, example of, of an API that's not quite scholarly like we've talked about before. Um, could you go to the next slide? Um, another popular API that's been pretty evergreen um, for the past couple years I've seen is the Twitter API. So since 2008, since Twitter started, it's become this platform that's grown immensely and become a huge valuable resource to get um, a sense of the latest topics and discussions. I'm sure some of us are on there um, and people are adding billions of tweets a day across the world. So it becomes this huge resource. Um, and Twitter provides specific access for academic research, as you can see here. And they also have a business API option. So there are different ways that you can register to use their API. Um, and like, um, like Tim, Kat, and Stephanie mentioned before, there are um, APIs that require registration and Twitter is one of them. So you need an API key for this. Um, and uh, I should note that Twitter does limit the different time frames in which you can access the data. Um, the number of tweets that you can get, there are rate limits. Um, for example, you might only get a subset of the tweets for a given search. So um, that's the power of a proprietary um, platform like this. They, they can control how much they give you. Um, and they have certain agreements that you have to um, sign off to. Um, I also wanted to add here that, like Stephanie said, there are Python and R packages that you can use for um, to access APIs more efficiently. And one, uh, one really great example is um, this one called SN Scrape, which is available through the Python, um, the Python package index, PyPy. Um, and it allows you to access the Twitter API more efficiently. And it kind of simulates the advanced search when you're on Twitter. So um, if you've ever gone on Twitter and you went into the search option and you wanted to search by a certain date and you wanted to search by a specific term, um, it SN Scrape simulates that. Um, next slide, please. 
So um, another really great resource is um, on the web on the website GitHub. There's a popular tag called Awesome Lists. So if you search Awesome Dash List, um, people have created um, GitHub repositories for very specific lists, and one of them is a list for APIs across the web. Um, I included the links here. So for there's one for public APIs. And I recommend checking that one out. And then the, the second one is an awesome list of APIs that's more used for like web development. But the second, um, the first link is a huge list. Um, if you could click on that link, it just kind of scrolls through all the different subjects and categories of APIs that are available online. And these are publicly accessible. And somebody mentioned earlier um, video games, and that's one section there. Um, and that's pretty much for open, open API resources. Next slide. And we're at questions. I see a few questions in the chat. Feel free to put questions in the chat or, um, you know, raise your hand or unmute and ask a question. Um, we wanted to leave time since this is both a gentle and friendly introduction to APIs, but in a short period of time, that can also be a lot of information. Um, so we're more than happy to clarify this definitely doesn't cover everything, but hopefully it can start pointing you in the right direction. And um, you can always reach out to your campus library if you have questions. So Kat is at UCR, I'm at UC San Diego, Timely are at UCLA. There are other equivalents at other UC campuses as well. So don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions in terms of accessing data through APIs. Um, I'll go ahead and answer a couple of questions. Uh, um, early questions, uh, one of which was has to do with logistics of this. Um, yes, we are recording it. Yes, it will be available publicly. And yes, you will have uh, access to the slides as well. And I also uh, put in the chat, if you could, um, could you fill out, uh, give us feedback on, the ses on this session uh, so that you know, we can make it better. Oops. So for the question about recommended environment setups for Python or R, um, if you could throw either a little more information um, in terms of what you're looking for into the into the chat or unmute, there are lots of resources in terms of what kind of environments you should have. The short answer is basically keeping everything up to date. So make sure you're on you know, Python 3, not 2.7, and make sure updated on R. And um, yeah, that's kind of the general one for in terms of recommended environment setups. It really depends on your personal preferences. There's, um, I would add that we, um, we're all Carpentries instructors in, in this thing. We, we teach with Anaconda Python, which is a convenience for people that are new to Python because it includes probably too many, but a lot of different these modules, including API modules and stuff that come with it when you download and install that version, of, that distribution of Python. So that's often an easier way to get started, but it is a big hunker. Um, Yeah, I was going to comment on the uh, Google APIs. They do function similarly. Um, some of them do function specifically within um, uh, uh, JavaScript, that you have to write it within JavaScript. But um, a lot of the documentation that we went over, how you read it and how things are called, it's very similar. Uh, it's, but it's just that you have to learn the vocabulary for whichever API it is that you're using, because they're all going to be a little different. We have a question about uh, whether scholarly APIs 
the list from UCLA is available to you colleagues. So um, our link is public, but that's a resource mainly for to let UCLA, the UCLA community know which APIs they have access to. But I imagine that the California Digital Library has access to pretty much all those APIs too. Um, I'm trying to pull up a link for that. If I think I see Kat nodding, so I think that's probably true. Let me try to pull a link for that. Yeah, and and I think um, the best thing to do with that, because that's wonderful. I hadn't seen that list before, um, and I don't have anything like that at, at UCR, but if a uh, Riverside colleague said, hey, can you give me something like that? That means that I would then focus on it. So you can always contact your data uh, librarian or your data lab and ask them, or your library in general, and ask them if they have that list and, and give them uh, the list from UCLA as an example. Yeah, well, I'll just end up sharing the same resources. <laughs> That's one thing to, to, you know, to know about these APIs that are proprietary that often there's some restrictions on how you can share the data as well. Like the Twitter one is notorious. You can't reshare their data. <laughs> you know, it's, it's part of the terms of service. So often you wanna look at the terms of service for the use of the data as well, once you collect it. But it's just one of those peculiarities because Twitter say they own, they own that data. But if you're insured, should all be in their documentation? It can sometimes be buried, but um, definitely echoing what Tim is saying in terms of what you can do with the data. And so um, if there is, you know, an API that you are using, um, maybe, you know, you can't put the data that you use anywhere public. You might be able to share your results, but you can't actually reshare the data. And this doesn't really happen in some of the open source ones. Um, it's more for the proprietary ones. Um, sometimes you may run into it for the open source, but their terms of use are mostly that you will use it, you know, for academic purposes and you won't go ahead and try to turn around and resell it. So all of it is documented. Um, the documentation can get a little bit dense at times, but um, as Kat mentioned, they all have a very similar syntax. And once you get comfortable with the general concept and the framework of an API call, the, the syntax ends up being a relatively small detail. So understanding the base URL, whether you're filtering and searching. And then there are a bunch of other tools that can help you build searches as well. And so the examples we were going through are using um, the APIs. There are some different applications out there, some that I use that will kind of help you build <laughs> your API query. You can kind of tell it exactly what you're looking for and it will help you build the query and you can use it that way as well. And then it will also help you format your results so that they're not quite as overwhelming and it can help start formatting some of that JSON into a format that is a little more user readable. And I'll throw a link to one of those. Yeah, I want to know. Um, also, um, going off of uh, what the uh, Tim and Stephanie are saying, especially like about Twitter and things that are proprietary, um, you, you, you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. Um, in terms of Twitter, you know, you don't have to read all of their terms of service on how you can share it, even though you should know it, but there are organizations and archivists and librarians who have actually done a lot of this uh, intellectual um, work for you on figuring out how it is that these things can be shared as data uh, supporting your research. And so for that, I would say um, definitely um, talk to your librarian about this if you want to use something, because while you may not know, I would say that all of my colleagues at the, um, at the UCs um, that work with data, we all sort of already know some of these other, we know more of the landscape, right? And so um, leverage us as well as part of your, your um, uh, research.
Hi, can I ask a question through the mic? Uh, so I wanted to ask um, what, how feasible is it to create an API request for say a database of information I have? So if I wanted to share that with colleagues to access the data through an API request, is that feasible? Um, I would say, I mean, it, it can be done because obviously people make them. I think it depends on your level of experience with computer science and um, databases. Because behind most of these APIs is what's called a SQL database. Um, that's why a lot of the, the syntax looks very uh, similar. Um, and so knowing how to um, share that, that would create that API. But um, I would say you'd, you'd have to be super comfortable with all of that in like advanced databases. I would, I would add, if you notice that both the Star Wars and OSF um, APIs were kind of wrapped in this Django API. I don't know if you saw it. The, the, so those are both from a framework, which is in Python called Django that helps create APIs. Now, like Kat's saying, you have to know that framework in Python and all that stuff to be able to wrap it around a database that you'd want to provide access. But there are like kind of helper tools to create APIs um, in, a, in a particular languages. So, you know, it'd take a little while asking around, but probably be worth inquiry to ask people who are developing APIs on your campus, um, you know, to see if there's a kind of a designated one people go to in your department or something. Thank you. What's tags, Dennis, uh, Tim? Are you gonna uh, sorry, I, I need to find the URL, but it's a uh, Google spreadsheet add-on that lets you consume the Twitter API and you can feed it a keyword and it will start to crawl the API and develop a data set. So one of the peculiarities though with Twitter is that you can only go seven days back in the Twitter API. Otherwise you have to pay, you know, I, I don't, I, I never can get it straight. Every, they change it every time I look at it. But it's, yeah, they have a paid mode for researchers. But that tags is kind of a cool thing to get started really quick. And then you'd want to look for something in a programming language if you want to go like further, you know. Um, TweetPy is the Twitter one I know. I think R Twitter or something. I always forget the R one. But there's going to be a, one in each kind of language that you can use. Maggie, to answer your question about APIs on the CDL site, I was actually browsing around and I couldn't find it yet. So I can, um, I'm going to look around and we can send out the, add that to our slides. So uh, Gabrielle's asking, and I'm guessing this is about the Twitter API, you have to pay to go back more than seven days. Um, yes, Tim, I think that's the default right now, right? Yeah, that, that SN scrape thing that, that Lee showed is a kind of workaround to that where you it mimics the, so if you search Twitter on the website, it goes back further than seven days. So mm -hmm. this tool mimics that and then it grabs all the IDs for that. And then you can use 
another tool to go back and get all that. Twitter is crazy. They just, they restrict so much, but there are workarounds, but typically if you're going to do large scale collecting, you would, you'd pay for it. And there's like, there's vendors that provide that data. Um, well, and if you're going to do large scale collecting of Twitter uh, within a research model that you start from now, then what you can do is you can start downloading your data as you're going along. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't share that data, that's okay. And then you'll be able to process it, right? At some point in the future. Yeah, cool. There are collections of what they call deflated Twitter data out there. That, because if you remove all the content and just provide the identifier for each tweet, then you can share that. But then over time, like you expect 15% of those things to disappear because people delete their tweets. Twitter data. Anyway. Yeah, Gabrielle, I, I don't think so, but I, I would love to be wrong. That it, I don't know, I mean, maybe, we just had a inquiry just recently, and I were working with somebody. So, um, about um, yeah, going farther back. About the pay version, or I, I just there's, I don't know. Does anybody else have experience with Twitter? Cat, thank you. I, I actually do from. Um, a couple of years back, not recent, and so they may have changed it. But what I recall is it was either 14 days. I mean, it was a little long mm. more whenever I was able to access a specific um, data. Um, they have different versions that you can access through the their API. And there was one that I was able to get more than uh, seven oh, cool. days. Um, and I thought it was it was like, four hmm. weeks worth and um, but I had to access it through using um, Python so yeah that, that's that's great to hear um, yeah well we 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 are at noon and I want to be uh, cognizant of people who want to go um, I can sit we you know Obviously, I think Tim Lee and I can stay around a little bit longer if people have questions, but um, please uh, fill out our, our uh, give us feedback. We, oops, we really would appreciate that. And um, I hope you have a great uh, bit of Love Data Week. Um, Thanks for joining us, everyone. Okay. Thank you.